So we're going to screen share the Manjushri practice. Oh no, I'm just repeating Lama's word. Much to the Guru and the Protector, Venerable Mandragosha, you wish, your wisdom is brilliant and pure like the sun. Free from the clouds of the two obscurations, you perceive the whole of reality exactly as it is, and so hold the book of transcendental wisdom at your heart. You look upon all beings in prison within samsara, enshrouded by the thick darkness of ignorance, and tormented by suffering. With the love of a mother for her only child, your enlightened speech, endowed with the sixty melodious tunes, like the thundering roar of a dragon, awakens us from the sleep of destructive emotions and frees us from the chains of karma. Dispelling the darkness of ignorance, you wield the sword of wisdom to cut through all our suffering. Here from the very beginning, you have reached the end of the ten bumis and perfected all enlightened qualities for most of the Buddha's heirs. Your body is adorned with 112 marks of enlightenment. To Mandragosha, the gentle voice, I prostrate and pray, dispel the darkness from my mind. With all of the kindness and love, let your wisdom shine. Clear the darkness of my ignorance once and for all. Grant me, I pray, the intelligence, the brilliance, to understand the scriptures, the words of the Buddha, and the works of the masters. And whenever I wish to look upon you, or ask you of anything at all, Lord and Protector Manjushri, let me see you without any hindrance. We're going to do a meditation now.
Good evening. How's it working? Working? Good. Uh, I'm glad there's uh, a good um, Zoom turnout. So Zoom Dharma. <laughs> like it. So uh, the last um, about, uh, last week, not this Sunday, but before Elizabeth Zim and I were talking about uh, Abhidharma. Um, and now we're talking about Abhidharma again. Um, so we're uh, becoming uh, real professional yogis, right? Uh, uh, we want to be educated yogis who have uh, become informed and familiar with uh, um, basic approaches to Dharma. I don't want to say text because that sounds like that's just information. Um, the approaches and the yogas and the views and the meditations that have been passed down, many of them orally, but some have to be passed down by recordings, in this case, uh, ink. But, so we're not learning text, we're learning um, Dharma directly. So <clears throat> I'm delighted that we have a good turnout tonight. The book we're uh, referring to, I'm now holding it up to here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, this is um, a translation of Vasubandhu's summary of the five heaps, the, or the five skandhas, sometimes called the five aggregates. Vasubandhu's most famous text was the Abhidharma, is the Abhidharma Kosha. So um, we're not reading the Kosha uh, in this part of the program. Generally, Abhidharma Kosha in a uh, setting like Sarajay might be a five year project right there. Um, but I wanted us to read uh, and must read Abhidharma. So I, I tried to pick something that I think is the uh, most concise and most necessary to you know, and that's um, understanding and practicing from the standpoint of uh, the five skandhas, the five heaps. <clears throat> In the past, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and before that, I recommended um, Stephen Goodman's book. Open up to this camera, hello. The Psycho Buddhist Psychology of Awakening. Uh, Dr. Goodman uh, presents uh, Abhidharma correctly from an uh, experiential standpoint uh, as a way of knowing and developing prajna or wisdom, not just as a, um, a, ma a map or, or taxonomy, right? So I, I'd like us to have that approach and uh, Dr. Engel Artemis uh, also has an experiential approach and I recommend highly um, uh, his introduction as well as the translations um, because he's able uh, to go into depth um, both as a scholar and practitioner. <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to just uh, read out some quotes because I don't think uh, that many people have uh, the actual text. But um, if you do have the actual text in hand, could you just like do this? And then let's see. Like, if you have the text in front of you. Yeah. Here you are. So, Zina is good, of course. Well, Abhidharma, buddy. Thank you. And I think uh, 
that one's there's got the that one all right you downloaded it very good <clears throat> So uh, the two texts translated here, Vasubandhu and uh, Stiramati's uh, detailed commentary on summary of the heaps. And I'd like to quote from Stiramati. This is from on page 13, the prologue by um, Artemis. The heaps are exactly five in number, neither more nor less, because they were taught as the entities that constitute the basis for grasping eye and mind. Most immature beings grasp consciousness as an eye and the remaining heaps as mind. I'd like to read that again. The heaps are exactly five in number, neither more nor less, because they were taught as the entities that constitute the basis for grasping an eye and mind, and the mind. Most immature beings grasp consciousness as an eye and the remaining heaps as mind. Isn't this so? Even when uh, people are studying Abhidharma closely, sometimes they think, oh, well, of course, uh, the body is not me, the feelings aren't me, the perceptions aren't me, but the consciousness is me. So then I say, oh, you're in the wrong class. You should be studying Advaita Vedanta, right? <laughs> so here by consciousness, we mean um, an awareness perceiving an object, right? So this is Avijnana, uh, so uh, not Jnana, like our names, like Geshe, but Vijnana. So consciousness of I and other. And we take that most of the time to be the self, right? And then we say, I'm my body, my feelings, like that. We usually don't say that. We, maybe you could say my consciousness, I guess, as new age people, perhaps. Uh, in short, the Tathagata taught the doctrine of the five heaps, both to describe how we should correctly understand the momentary phenomena that make up our ordinary experience, and as the foundation for explaining how a deluded person wrongly believes that his or her existence is governed by a real person's self. Stiramati discusses the mistaken belief in a real self at some length in relationship to the root mental affliction known by the technical term perishable collection view, Chakya Dirsti. <clears throat> so uh, most of the time we're saying, okay, I want to overcome my mistaken views. I want to overcome self-cherishing. I want to be awake. Um, want to realize Mahamudra and Dzogchen. Uh, this is fine, we should be saying these things, but if we're not realizing that fundamentally we're, um, if we're fundamentally still identifying ourselves with the five skandhas, then it doesn't matter, we're still stuck. <clears throat> Uh, um, it goes on to say the requirements for developing genuine renunciation, which is defined as the mind that seeks to achieve liberation, and the practice of the four closely placed recollections, which serve to counter the four erroneous beliefs and bring about an experiential awareness of the four noble truths is required. The knowledge that is central to both of these topics is the form of transcendent correct view that realizes the insubstantiality of the person. The four erroneous beliefs are deeply ingrained predispositions that cause ordinary beings to mistakenly regard one 
what is impure as pure, what is impermanent as permanent, what is unsatisfactory that is suffering as a state of well-being, and what is not real self to, as constituting a real self. The object of all these beliefs is the same, the five grasping that is samsaric heaps. <clears throat> That is on page 15, yeah. <clears throat> now, we have these five heaps, and then of course we have as we went over the other Sunday, all kinds of uh, feelings and perceptions and states that um, uh, are associated with our makeup. Um, so uh, it does help to know uh, a little bit more than the five heaps. For example, even in uh, regular Western therapy, we like to say, um, there's a difference between thinking and feeling and emotion, right? So in couples counseling, most of the time, people go, um, I feel you're really a jerk. <laughs> and then the therapist has to say, that's a judgment or a thought, that's not a feeling, what do you feel? And many times, I hate to say it, it's usually the male. <laughs> Many times uh, they have to repeat it, right? They don't even have the word. So sometimes the therapist has, it looks like right now uh, you're feeling angry. And if someone's done some practice or some insight, they'll go, yes, you're right, I'm, I'm angry. And, and I still think they're a jerk or something like that. <laughs> But that's uh, rudimentary Abhidharma, isn't it? It's important to be able to distinguish things because without those, we're not be able to become free of them. So uh, if we're still stuck that way, um, it uh, won't it, it won't uh, do for us to just say we're going to on top of it generate. Uh, loving kindness or on top of it try to gem generate the view because we're still uh back in grasping and merging with uh merging all the uh different skandhas and the different dharmas right <clears throat> so to actually correctly understand the view of mahamudjan Chen, it's necessary to uh have some distinguishing right so that um, even when we have a mind as spacious as the sky, we're not confusing uh, thoughts and emotions, right? You can say, I have a mind as spacious as the sky, but um, if, if you don't know when you're hungry or you don't know when you're full, um, food-wise, you're, you're going to have a problem, don't you think? Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> so what are the four closely uh, placed um, recollections that overcome the four uh, errors that allow us to um, disidentify or stop grasping on the skandhas of the self? Maybe someone has already written or, or read that far ahead. Is that possible? Anybody out in Abhidharma land? What would be another word for the four recollections? No, not that one. It's not the four thoughts that turn the mind to the Dharma, but you get points for playing.
It has the word mindfulness in it. What do you think, Patty? No? My apologies. I don't know. I'm, hope, I'm looking at my friends, and they're looking for the answer, I believe. <laughs> We see it, you know, it's very popular. Uh, mm, Thich Nhat Hanh made it very popular. What are the four foundations of mindfulness? What do you think? What, what should we, if we're doing the four foundations of mindfulness, we start out with mindfulness of the body, right? <clears throat> no. Four foundations of mindfulness? Yeah, no, no one? Yeah. No. Who, who's muted? <clears throat> Keep going. Anybody else? I already gave you one. Feelings. Feelings, who said feelings? Jack, hi. Go ahead, Patty, you can help. Cheaters can help sometimes. Just to let you guys know, I, I found it in the way we all look at these t kind of times. And so um, what I found are um, the mindfulness of the body, the mindfulness of feelings like Jack just said, mindfulness of mind and the mindfulness of dharma is this is this what you were referring yes. to the mind are sometimes called entities artemis says entities yeah. so the meditation of the mindfulness of these four types uh asanga who artemis also quotes says um when, when we fail to have these four mindfulnesses, uh, the error causes us to develop these mistaken views that the body is the seat in which the real self resides. That pleasant and unpleasant feelings are, are experiences that a real self undergoes. That mind constitutes a real self. And fourth, the various mental factors that are the entities that cause the real self either to remain afflicted or to become spiritually purified. So by paying attention to uh, these four aspects, then we stop grasping at the five skandhas. There are five skandhas. Yeah, so the uh, third and fourth uh, skanda, like perceptions and uh, formations, we usually also take to be a self. So then we're grouping those together under the four. <clears throat> And entities. So usually in the mind, we have all our perceptions and thoughts, and then entities like space, <laughs> you know, like space is myself, <laughs> or uh, this is my, this is the self, or fire, or, you know, 
impermanence is the self, you know, so all these different uh, dharmas, these different truths experience. So uh, by <clears throat> talking about the five skandhas is all there is, and then how we grasp on to them and we make these assumptions that what is pure is impure, uh, but we understand the impure is pure, the impermanent is permanent, and so forth, then we get stuck in samsara. So this is one of the, um, you know, I know we, the Buddha said, uh, said to have first taught the Four Noble Truths as a way to set the stage, but uh, when you get down to like, well, what actually happens? How do we uh, grasp at things? What, how are we making the mistake? How do we get screwed up? This is the essence. We're grasping on certain things as being the self, as being I and their mine. And this is the way to untangle. So all the advanced meditations basically come down uh, to these uh, four mindfulnesses, don't they? What else is there? There's arms, there's body, there's feelings, <laughs> there's all these different mind states, and there's what we think exists, right? And all of these, we eventually grasp on as some kind of self or some kind of solid other, and then we get trapped in samsara. It, it sounds pretty simple, don't you think? No? What do you think out there? Simple? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, let's pause for some questions. Hmm? Or I could go over the entities. Do you want to know what the entities that Asanga says are some of the problems that we think ourself? Okay. One, desire. Two, the subdual of desire. Three, hatred. Subdual of hatred. Ignorance. Subdual of ignorance. Contraction. Distraction. Languor. Retention. Excitation. Absence of excitation. Pacification. Absence of pacification. The state of being well composed. The state of not being well composed. The state of cultivating the path well. The state of not having cultivated the path well. You may, that may sound kind of ridiculous, but um, I talk with people all the time, like, tell me about your training. Oh, uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't done very well this week. You've made it into a self. I haven't done very well. That's me. That's me. I haven't done very well. I know it sounds like you're being good Catholics or something. I don't know. <laughs> There it is. You're making an entity and grasping onto that. Uh, I'm, I'm a not very, I'm a not very good practitioner self. I don't know what this means. Like you're waving. No. Okay. Good. Uh, Well, we don't have to go into it now, do we? We've already gone over it. But... Mm. Does, does the person asking the question uh, have the book? Hmm. Shanti Deva said that realizing that insight well yoked to quiescence 
brings destruction of the mental afflictions, one should pursue quiescence first by engaging in detachment toward the world. So when reading Dharma, particularly um, when, uh, you know, uh, reading particularly Abhidharma, it's always important to start really with uh, at least 24 minutes of shamatha. We didn't do that today. But otherwise, um, we get really confused, don't you think? <clears throat> so in detail, uh, if people want to go uh, first in detail on page uh, uh, of this book, 151, the first object of closely placed recollection, the body. And then that goes on for quite a while. <laughs> and then, uh, then what would be the next? Right. So, um, Then page 166, the second object of closely placed recollection, feelings. Vasubandhu's summary of the five heaps states that feelings are classified according to the three types of experience. One, that which is pleasant. Two, that which is unpleasant. And three, that which is neither pleasant nor unpleasant. As noted earlier, these three types of feeling have an important and direct correlation with the explanation of the three types of suffering. Thus, one of the main forms of practicing closely placed recollection of feelings or mindfulness of feelings is for the practitioner to reflect on and recognize the meaning of the three types of suffering in relation to the range of experiences that make up his or her own feeling heap. This exercise corresponds to a Sangha's remark that closely placed recollection of feelings was formulated as an antidote for the error that regards what is unsatisfactory as a state of well being. <clears throat> so many times I have to point out to people that um, actually they're, what they think are as pleasurable feelings actually is quite painful. I'm wondering if anybody think or is willing to offer you know, from their own experience like I used to think this was painful or pleasurable but now I realize it's painful can anybody in the audience give an example okay yes <laughs> I find that that's I find that that's true with crushes yeah, crushes, yeah. Having a crush that was very, when I was younger, that was very uh, pleasurable for me and exciting. Mm. And now it seems very disorienting and overwhelming. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Good example. For drunkenness. Say again. Drunkenness. Drunkenness. <laughs> Oh. Drug use. Drug use, yeah. Good example. Who else? Speak up if you've got a hand up. I used to like amuse amusement park rides, and now I don't anymore. Roller coasters and things that flipped you upside down and such. Yeah, that's really, yeah, that's a really good example. <laughs> I would, uh, um, although I like the drunkenness, the bluntness of that, I think that any kind of medicating over um, feeling, you know, like uh, just even a few cocktails, like it's not all out drunkenness, but kind of shoving it down initially feels pleasurable because it's a uh, hiding and that, but that ultimately that it leads to a lot of sorrow. <clears throat> So uh, 
it's hard, you know, but the reason we have to practice shamatha vipassana is that actually we, we want to catch ourselves in the middle of it. One of the um, big uh, uh, emotions that uh, sometimes feels pleasant, but actually is not pleasant, is, is real anger, right? When we're really angry at someone and we're mean and hostile, there's a certain pleasure in that, right? We think, oh, that's pleasurable. I'm glad I got that off my chest, or it felt good just to tell that person to F off. But it doesn't really feel good. Anger really doesn't feel good. It's disruptive. It's jar jarring, right? But many, many of the times we feel, you know, like when we're in that place, we feel a little bit more powerful. We might even say we feel really good when we get angry. But I found with Dharma practitioners, the more we practice, we go, um, sometimes I have to get angry, perhaps, you know, on a relative's level to do things with sometimes and of course, we need that to protect ourselves, but we're not pretending that it feels good. I don't know, that's, that's one big example I have, maybe from my own life. Anybody else want to chime in? <clears throat> yeah, with anger, even, um, even subtle anger, I, I noticed that for the rest of the day, I'm kind of disturbed. Um, and, you know, so just getting mad at when the, my computer doesn't work the way I want it to um, really, really uh, shakes me up for the rest of the day if I'm noticing on a subtle level. So, yeah. Yeah, good example. <laughs> computer. Okay. Patty knows one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if it is one, but I'm not sure if it applies, but I used to think, you know, kind of you know, pouring my heart out about like some injustice done to me that I think done to me <laughs> uh, felt like some sort of like connection or relief or something, but that has become like a feeling that's just the opposite, actually. It doesn't feel good at all. Is, is that an example? Yeah, like that. And I catch myself yeah. doing it because yeah. it's a very deep habit, and I realize that that's not not really what's happening, and it just doesn't feel right. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, in experiential abhidharma, we're not just um, noting something as pleasant or unpleasant or, or neutral. Um, that's sometimes done in. Uh, some beginning, you know, practices where we have to, you know, start just noticing the territory and we're noticing the different dharmas or different experiences we have. Uh, where it's like, oh, that's anger, that's jealousy, that's joy, that's space, that, you know. Um, but uh, the noting or the noticing then implies uh, a practice behind it. So of course, if we notice that uh, it actually doesn't feel uh, pleasant to be angry, then of course, uh, we are going to engage in the practice of patience for one and other insight oriented practices to uh, disassemble and disidentify from that as uh, a self, as a pleasant experience. We're still gonna have the experience, right? We can't have experience saying we're not thinking that that is me, that is self, that's Atman. We're not thinking that it's pleasant. But uh, that doesn't mean that it immediately goes away, does it? What do you think? Is just noting or uh, developing patience as an antidote to anger, does the anger then go away? What, what do you guys think? We have, we have a no from the, <laughs> the house audience. <laughs> no, no, I'm just I'm saying, Greg Goldbakey is saying no. Any, anybody out, out in Zoom, Zoom Dharma land? What do you think? It loses some of its charge though, if you look at it like that, notice it and look at it. 
especially if you have a little antidote. You know, I think it loses some of its power and charge. I think it definitely does. I agree with you. Yeah, it's then uh, it's, it, it's sometimes it becomes handleable. So then we can look in, in depth to not, not just is it, uh, am I identifying with this or not, but also what's its essence? How does it actually, is it actually, uh, does it actually exist the way it appears, right? So when we're doing Vipassana or Latong superior seeing, we're noticing both how things appear uh, ordinarily, but then we're also investigating to see how they actually are. So when we investigate the deep conflicting emotions, uh, they appear one way, but when we look deeply into them, we see that uh, they're actual uh, different than the way they appear. So from a uh, Madhyamka point of view or a Heart Sutra point of view, when we look deeply into uh, even disturbing emotions, uh, uh, what do we actually find? Anybody? Mama. Yes. We don't find anything. I mean, there's nothing behind them. And there's, there's nothing, nothing there. There's nothing behind. It's a shell game. But I have a question. Yes. We generally talk about anger right. with this, or like sadness even. Right. But I find it more difficult to talk about these with love or happiness because it's much easier to get caught up in love and happiness or, or excitement and think that it's there and have that fulfilling in a way, then like anger isn't fulfilling. Anger does feel bad, but love and happiness feels good. It does feel good. And it's much harder to, to step back and do the same mm -mm. meditation, the same process with something that like, oh, this is happy. This is good. Yay. <clears throat> this is blissful. Yes. It's much harder to do that. So why, why do we focus on anger with this when, when it's the same thing, with love and happiness and excitement? Um, generally, in a, a long rim approach, which uh, Artemis takes, you know, which, which I like in, in the presentation of uh, um, the Abhidharma here, um, uh, you know, anger is, at least from Vajrayana point of view, is that anger is going to be seen as the most destructive. So um, sometimes people start there. But of course, in, in some of the Hinayana traditions, they start with desire is the most destructive and the most difficult, like that. Um, and then of course, sometimes we say, well, actually, ignorance is the, the toughest one to overcome most destructive because it's the source like that. Um, but generally, we would say in Mahayana that we live in the uh, Kama Loka, the pleasure world, you know, we're, we're in that, um, that realm where we, we seek, uh, you know, pleasure and comfort. That's the defining, one of the defining aspects of uh, the human world we're in. So it, it's very difficult to, um, to see uh, that uh, normal pleasures with a afflicted consciousness are, are not lasting, they're not permanent, they don't constitute um, an identity or self that we can depend on. It's very difficult, right? Otherwise we wouldn't have addictions, you know, just drop it. So, I, you know, maybe, maybe like the scientists say, there's a negativity bias towards seeing um, the stick on the dark road as a snake. So, you know, we could say in Buddhism, we say there is a bias towards pursuing uh, pleasurable states of mind and objects. And so much of the uh, practices, um, uh, particularly in Tantra, is to say, actually, the real bliss and the real pleasure is completely different than the passing pleasure that um, is limited, yeah. It's very difficult. Does it all come down to pleasurable states of mind? 
I mean, like, and this is sort of what I, I guess I get a little confused about is that does the, the feeling and the, you know, do all those, those four, uh, I forget which different word to use, but those, those four attributes all come down to states of mind. I mean, do they all literally get funneled through our, our consciousness at some point, and so they're just literally states of mind? Well, if we say states of mind, you know, uh, then the grasping, you know, so Tilopa said to Naropa, it's not appearances that are its problem, it's the grasping after appearances. So yes, it's, it's that grasping that, um, you know, is that, that fundament, the fundamental problem there? It's the, you know, ignorant grasping that becomes the real problem, not, um, not any particular uh, experience. Yes, no. I, I, I'm going to sit with that one. Sit with that one. So, I mean, like, how, how is, uh, I guess, pres bodily preservation ignorant grasping? Uh, like, if, I don't want to get hypothermia, so I want to be warm. Yeah, so we're we're talking about grasping fundamentally into uh, a sense of Atman and what Atman owns. So the, the problem is not wanting to preserve or continue something, um, but um, it's, it's wanting it to be a self, <coughs> meaning that it would, we, we would own it, that we are it, that it would be permanent. So uh, all the different, when the states of mind are realized as uh, conditional and uh, impermanent, then uh, uh, that means we're operating from a wisdom mind, which means, uh, like it's say in Zen, you know, uh, when it's cold, put on your coat. So that's not a problem. That's not grasping, you know, if you say, oh, it's hot, so I'm gonna take off my jacket or it's cold, I'm gonna put on my jacket. <clears throat> like that, that's not grasping. That's wisdom mind, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, it would be one of the aspects of our self, lots of times that's gone into, of course, is uh, Dharma of pride, you know, so. I'm really smart that I have the wisdom to put, you know, I'm the best because I have the wisdom to put on my coat when it's cold, you know, then that would, that would be a grasping to uh, a sense of self by using the uh, phenomena of pride. <clears throat> In the introduction here, like Artemis goes into all the different kinds of pride. I don't know why I get a kick out of reading it. It's maybe it has to do with my pride, you know, <laughs> that's very catechism like something. <clears throat> isn't isn't there a real sense of sadness in um in this though mama uh sadness yeah like i was uh last summer i wanted a new ipad every year i want a new ipad and finally i was so excited by my desire for an iPad. I looked up all the iPads. I studied all the iPads. I knew which iPad I wanted and I knew which iPad I could afford. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, I better really look at this iPad mania. And suddenly I realized, yes, I've had iPads in the past and their batteries go dead. Mm -hmm. And there's like a capsule. They start out great and then you hate them because they get crappy. And it's kind of like there's a level of sadness when you look at that and say, yes, there's a capsule of decay immediately upon purchasing your iPad. It's going to die. It's the same with plants. Yeah. You know, you have a dahlia that you love 
and the dahlia is beautiful and the dahlia is already going to die before it blooms. We can't hear you actually. Oh, sorry. No. Can you hear me now? No. Okay. Now, now we can. Um, this isn't quite what Vasubandhu, or the Buddha, or Stiramati Asanga is getting at. So, of course, we're talking about some obsessional behaviors that obviously are dysfunctional, but the root thing is underneath that, how um, there's a self that forms behind, so to speak, among that, that kind of grasping. So uh, this, this is kind of a difference between what I would say is traditional Western psychology, which would say, okay, this is how we're going to work with, um, you know, some craving and grasping uh, addiction kind of issues. You know, we're going to do systematic desensitization or we're going to talk about consequences and da 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 da, but still not talk about um, the sense of uh, how uh, we turn what we're doing into uh, a deeply ingrained uh, sense of uh, uh, identity behind it, you see. So we're trying, we're trying to get to that deeply grained identity that uh, causes the, um, the behaviors that uh, look, you know, are symptoms that come out as symptomatic behavior. And that, that's why it takes a lot of meditation because um, when we apply the um, situational antidotes, such as patience or, you know, or, um, you know, like even patience where we don't reach for another computer, another cookie, um, it's not cutting through that root sense of self. It's helping, it helps immensely to do the shamatha practice and to do uh, patience, even conventional patience, because then uh, the situation slows down, but, but we still um, uh, have to go after the thief, you see. We, we may have closed it, you know, as metaphoric, we may have closed the doors or something, but uh, the thief has still got away like that. I don't know, does that make a little sense? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Good answer, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, that's why we have these, why we keep pushing a little bit, um, because the tendency with uh, doing a lot of shamatha, and which is really good, but also and doing a lot of um, you know, kind of antidote kind of practice is that, uh, yes, the, the mistaken self is moved away, but it, it's parked over here. And under, uh, it's still operating behind the scenes, this, this uh, very strongly. So, you know, kind of psychoanalytical terms, we would say it's, it's been repressed. Suppression is conscious, but repressed is like we 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 don't even know it's there, okay? Because we think, oh, I've done a lot of calming practice. I, it's like it's like when folks go, yeah, I don't feel like having you know like new in recovery, and yeah, I haven't felt like having a drink at all in the last sixty days. I guess I'm done. Well, guess what? You know, so uh, it park it parks over here and. You know, we tend to like, okay, things are fine now. So we, we don't go after the mistaken self and we kind of like leave it. So uh, that's why we have to develop, you know, special, very strong bodhicitta. And uh, in our tradition, we develop strong tantric methods uh, to, uh, to get this little slippery character there, the thief got away. You know, because sometimes, <laughs> I don't know, I'm sure we've all had things stolen, you know, and sometimes we have some equanimity 
So they get, well, okay, they took this, but at least they left that, you know, so I can live with it. But, and then we don't, we don't pursue the problem. So, so much of the uh, 10 Bhumis, the stages, the Bodhisattva and the five paths, which I realize I didn't talk much about at retreat, are to, um, to continue the effort. So not just to have some stabilization and uh, some, uh, what we'd say in dialectical behavior therapy, emotional regulation, but instead to really uh, totally up uproot the mistaken sense of self and other. I don't know, I like, I like kind of um, mysteries, don't you? So I think uh, a lot of the Dharma practice is, um, uh, it's like a murder mystery. <laughs> so, uh, we have the five skandhas and we have um, the four um, problems, right? What are they called? Anybody? What what do what do we do with the what what's the problem? What what happens? How how does the skandhas end up being suffering? What are what are the four errors? I'm actually trying to be somewhat traditional teacher, like tell you what it is and then question answer and then go back to see if anybody remembers or has written it down. By the way, at the monastery and technically like you're not allowed to write anything down. One time, you know, like my friend uh, Lama Garrison was here teaching when I was back on what Avenue and uh, someone started uh, writing, you know, just like I allowed people here. And he said, put that pen down. <laughs> so uh, does anybody remember what the four errors are? <clears throat> so I can go home and sleep, sleep well tonight. No, those are the four recollections of the form mindfulnesses. But thanks for chiming in. You get credit for that. And those are correct. Those are the four recollections. That's very good. Uh, impure is pure. Right. Hello, hello. Um, and that. Uh, correct. Suffering is not suffering. Yes. And what is not a real self is a self. Right. <clears throat> so that's easy. Right. <clears throat> so the Abhidharma um, is not uh, just a collection of lists, but um, it has lists, of course, because it has to do with actual practice. Uh, so uh, if you say, okay, I understand, uh, I am suffering, uh, I understand the, that there's this path, but how do I actually uh, transverse it? How do I actually uh, do it? What, do I actually, what tools do I actually need? Then um, that's how the Abhidharma uh, came to be. Of course, the Buddha just didn't, you know, talk Abhidharma, the Abhidharma was uh, put together um, from uh, the essential parts of the teaching like that. <clears throat> so uh, in Abhidharma, there isn't uh, uh, the ad hominem style of the sutra, there isn't the, um, the Dharma talk, right? It's not, um, it's uh, assumed that you've been convinced that uh, you need to get out of the burning house and you've been convinced that grasping at the skandhas is a problem. And now you're saying, uh, what do we actually need to do? And that's when we actually uh, start doing, uh, you know, higher dharma, so to speak. 
What do you think? Last, last chance for a question, comment, or complaint before we end with the meditation. <laughs> Every dharma is like uh, CPR training, you know? So, uh, or any other detailed training, you know, the view is, of course, we wanna be helpful to people and we wanna see people healthy and we wanna respond correctly in emergency, but uh, actually knowing how to do CPR, knowing someone's anatomy, knowing how to correctly uh, responding if someone's in anaphylactic shock, right? That's that's actual information, right? Just having an open mind uh, or just being compassionate uh, isn't enough. You need to know how the body and mind work and how people actually get stuck, don't you? We need to have the compassion and the motivation and uh, the empathy and bodhicitta, but um, actually, how do, you, how do you free people, right? I don't know, like Patty's son probably knows how to do mountain rescue. You know, someone's stuck up on the side of Half Dome. You're not just going to say, it's okay, come on down. You know, you're going to actually, how do you actually do it? So the meditation teachings um, that we're going to get into uh, after we finish the textual study, the meditation and retreat manuals are very much how to do it. But, uh, we, we need to have this appreciation for both the, uh, to see how the mind and body work. We need to be acquainted with the tools. Uh, we need to know uh, how to sail the boat before we take you out into the open sea, right? <laughs> so I grew up sailing and, uh, you know, before um, um, Long Island Sound and, uh, I couldn't just take the boat out, right? So my uncle had a nice yacht. And even before we sail out of the harbor, uh, or even out of the open ocean, you'd have to like, what, okay, what's that? What's port? What's starboard? You know, what does he mean by haul in the sheets? What's the tiller, right? If you didn't know that, you weren't, you weren't going to get out because and you're out in the open seas, you know, uh, you know, you don't say, you'd have to say hard to starboard really quickly, right? Or let, let go of the jib or pull in the jib. And if you didn't know what it was, the ship would capsize. That makes sense, right? So if you're a pleasure sailor, you don't care to know any of the nomenclature or how to sail the boat, you're just along for the ride. But since we're bodhisattva yogis, uh, we not only enjoy the sail, uh, or, and we, you know, but we can actually sail the ship and we can rescue people at the same time. It's like that. <clears throat> so anybody who's a sailor here, you should always know like, which way do you spit? Do you know any sailors out there? <laughs> huh? Downwind, <laughs> but yeah, but <laughs> this, this is the real thing. So, on, <laughs> on, you know, if you go out for actually like a cruise, you're in a little cabin yacht, there, there are things that you have to empty into the ocean. I know it's not very ecological, but there are buckets of things that you're going to throw overboard, right? So, what do you do before? you throw something overboard. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you, you put up your finger and test the wind. Yeah. So that's, that's the prajna operational side. That's, that's the Abhidharma. You know, you, you know the, the steps uh, to do things. You're not just a passenger like that. So uh, let's, let's do, uh, you know, six minutes of Shamta uh, Vipassana or uh, Mahamudra, Zogchen, whatever you're doing, and then we'll say good night, okay? I really appreciate everyone's participation. I'm trying to be a little edgy tonight. Does it work? <laughs> Abhidharma kicks butt. Right, Zima? All right.
we're going to sit for six minutes.
Very good. Let's do closing. We're going to screen share. Due to the merits of these, these virtuous, virtuous actions, actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha, Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin, Tenzin Gyatso, please, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, and fading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of octopus compassion. Manjushi, master, master of flawless wisdom. wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losam Jagpa, I make requests at your holy feet. So I'm very proud of, uh, you know, people that um, have set aside uh, time in their lives to do uh, Dharma practice that involves, you know, uh, developing a strong motivation that involves uh, hours on the cushion that involves uh, reading and reflection uh, and that uh, ultimately involves service, right? And your service to others and helping create uh, beautiful Buddha fields, you know, so we have a beautiful Buddha field uh, here, Dona Darge, and I hope you have beautiful Buddha fields at your home, right? So you're inspired and you, you become Buddhas in your own Buddha field, right? So, uh, you know, maybe you were a little bit like the Mormons. So in the Lotus Sutra, you could uh, become a Buddha and have your own world system. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> maybe we don't maybe we don't need a whole world system but uh we want to extend our bodhicittas as far as we'd like to extend it don't you think so thank you for coming thank you for listening oh we got a hand somebody's got a hand no okay well, i'll wave goodbye then thank you ciao I'm good ciao thank you Lama. thank you Lama. good you guys are doing good <laughs> Thank you, Lama. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> That's good.